Welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're going to be going over a research paper called Language Models Are Unsupervised Multitask Learners. And I think this is a paper that's more commonly known as GPT-2. Um, and we're working our way through this anti-hype LLM reading list. So I'll put the link here if you guys want to see that. Um, the idea behind, oops, the idea behind this uh, reading list is adding links that are reasonably good explanations of how stuff works, no hype, no vendor context if possible, practical firsthand accounts and experience is preferred, and he says super rare at this point, or they say, I'm not sure exactly who published this. Um, we decided to choose the language models are unsupervised multitask learners for this one, but I think there's a lot of gems in this in this reading list that we'll want to go through. Um, but to start, as I was reading this paper, they have a lot of examples of uh, this was back in 2019 of how they were starting to hint at prompting. They didn't really call it prompting back then. They were just using language models to predict the next word. And so I thought as a fun exercise, I would take some training data that maybe none of us have seen yet today, and let's all vote on what we think the next word is going to be in the sentence. Hopefully you guys didn't check Twitter this morning. And if you did, maybe you didn't see this one. But everybody just kind of write down what they think the next word is. Elon said, listen to the Iliad as an audiobook. It was meant to be blank. Um, we had Scott say long, we had Ben say heard, um, Adam say Anne. Nice. Um, I think I would have also said heard, even though I already know what the answer is. Um, and before I reveal it to you, I also wanted to put it into Llama Chat to see what it says. Uh, so listen to the Iliad as an audiobook is meant to be. And since this language model was trained uh, to be like helpful and happy and cheery, it gives you a really long answer and says, and <laughs> politely points out that the Iliad is an epic poem written by Homer and is not possible to listen as an audiobook. So it took it very literally. Um, then I changed the prompt to say, um, complete the sentence with one word. And then I gave the sentence. It picked the word epic, which not a bad completion. Um, there's a brand new open source language model out there called Falcon 180B that you guys might have seen trending all over the place yesterday. Um, I gave it the same one, complete this with one word, and it picked herd. So three votes for herd. Um, what the tweet actually said was, bum, bum, bum. let me find it. Oh, maybe I didn't save the raw one. That's a fail on my part. Um, but I did edit, edit it in Photoshop. Spoken, so we were all wrong. <laughs> but you'll see how this kind of plays in to the paper later, because as you're predicting the next word, you kind of give a probability distribution of what you think the next word might have, might have been. So if we looked at all of our collective guesses and kind of like summed them up, we probably would have put heard with a probability of like 40%. Um, long with a probability of 10% or whatever, and then sampled from that and picked that. So thought that would be a fun example that one, we none of us had seen, and two, the language models hadn't seen. So uh, super cool. Pretty cool. 
So the links to these pa this paper, I'm putting right here, um, this was back in 2019, uh, ages ago in the language model days, <laughs> but actually relative re relatively recent. And the key takeaway from this paper is that these language models are unsupervised multitask learners. So a lot of the research that had been done up to this point was doing natural language processing on specific data sets, such as like a question answering data set or a machine translation data set or summarization. Um, and these were all structured as supervised learning tasks. So you have pairs of inputs and outputs, and you're trying to do that one specific thing. So you would have a data set specifically for question answering, a data set specifically for um, summarization. And in this paper, they argue that you can get pretty high quality results from a purely unsupervised approach um, to being able to do all of these different tasks. Um, and so they create this data set called web text that we'll talk about how, how big it is and how they collected it, but it's a few million web pages. Um, and it's, it's just fun reading these papers because they say the largest model is 1.5 billion parameters they called it GPT-2. That is just like tiny compared to the models out here today. Uh, like this Falcon one is 180 billion parameters and it's open source and you can run it in the Hugging Face UI, which is pretty wild. Um, but this small little 1.5 billion parameter model achieved state-of-the-art performance on seven out of eight language modeling data sets in a zero shot setting. Um, which means that they took a new data set, they didn't do any more training, and they just kind of had it complete the sentence as if it was predicting the next word, and it achieved state-of-the-art performance on seven of the eight data sets just doing that, which is pretty crazy. Um, so in the intro of the paper, uh, they reiterate that it's, machine learning is getting pretty good at supervised tasks, um, but that they are really at the point in 2019 where we're, we want to move towards more general systems that can perform many tasks without manually having to create and label training data sets for each one, um, because there's a lot of effort that's involved to manually curate hundreds or thousands, or we've seen data sets with like hundreds of thousands of examples, and you need a human in the loop labeling all of these things. So even some of the data sets we'll see later on in the paper only have like 300 examples because that's all of the annotation that they could afford to do. Um, and there's been a little bit of effort in collecting data sets that are like multitask learning data sets, they call it. So imagine taking the question answering data set and the machine translation data set and the summarization one and cobbling it all together into one data set. And they're like, that's just so much effort and you're missing out on data while you're doing that. So let's try to take an unsupervised approach. So the approach that they take is called language modeling. And language modeling, simply put, is just given the previous words in the sentence, predict what the next word is, exactly what we did at the start here. Um, and if you look at the paper, um, there's some fancy math. Maybe I'll just take a screenshot in here of what you might see in a paper uh, as language modeling. Um, and so it's saying like the probability of the next word S is the product of the probabilities of all the previous words 
given the next word. So you're basically just saying like, what's the probability of uh, listen as the first word in a sentence? What's the probability of to given the word listen? What's the probability of the given the word to and giving to the word listen? And you just keep doing that over and over again until you get to the last word. Um, and if you multiply all of those probabilities together um, and do a little fancy math so that it doesn't just make a really small number, you get this metric called perplexity, um, which you'll see in some of these papers. And perplexity is basically just like how well, given the data set, are you predicting the next word? So we'll see some numbers that they report on that metric later. Um, but you could imagine cobbling together all of these other data sets and making kind of like triples that are the task you want it to do in plain English. Um, for example, translate the sentence from English to French and then putting the English sentence here and the French sentence here. And then the next example would be like, answer the question. And then the next piece of information is a document with some context. The next piece of information is the question itself. And then the final piece is the answer. Um, and so they talk about how there are some models at the time that did do this and put all these data sets together. There's one specifically they call out called MQuan. Um, that was able to perform a lot of these different tasks with this sort of data pre-processing. Um, but they argue that there's already so much diverse data on the web that's passively available um, that they wanted to try just simply training a large enough model on this data that the model would inherently learn patterns from the large data set, and they want to be able to generalize those patterns to all of these tasks. Um, they do note that this approach takes a lot longer to train because you have more and more data, but at the end of the day, they think it's going to be more robust and more generalized because you're not limited to these smaller annotated data sets. So the data set them itself, um, before they put this together, there were language modeling data sets from single domains. There is a language model data set that was purely news articles. And then often people would just grab all of Wikipedia and have that be a data set um, or just a dump of nonfiction books. And that would be a data set, but they weren't, there wasn't really one where it was all together, all these different data distributions. I remember when I worked on IBM Watson, we were mainly just using Wikipedia as the source of truth. Um, and that was just kind of like state of the art back in the day. But they noticed, okay, well, there's nearly an endless amount of data in the common crawl dump, um, but that data is extremely <laughs> noisy and in the paper they say the content is mostly unintelligible. Um, so they decided to create a new data set called web text um, that really emphasizes the document quality. And so what they did is they took and scraped all of the outbound links from Reddit and then they looked at the ones that received at least three karma and used this as a filter for humans found this content either interesting, educational, or just funny enough to share it and then reshare it. And they found that filtering the endless content from the web down to this subset from Reddit um, gave you a much cleaner data set. Um, so that resulted in about 45 million links. Uh, they used some tools called Dragnet and Newspaper to get the clean text from the HTML. They did some deduplication, some heuristics, and then the resulting data set was about 8 million documents and 40 gigabytes of text. Um, so remember, this is GPT-2 a while ago. The data sets that they're training on 
today are like the pile I think is 800 gigabytes and I don't know how many documents exactly, but they've at least tenfold updated the size of these data sets since, and we don't even know how much data was in GPT-4. Um, I don't think that's been published anymore. But just to give you a sense of the size and some of the pre-processing that they did to make it happen, when people say, oh, it's just trained on the internet, not quite. It's like trained on a cleaned subset of the internet that people did write some heuristics to make happen. Um, then they talk about the input representation to the model. So they talk about how they want to compute the probability of a new word given any possible string. And a lot of these language modeling tasks in the past have created a dictionary of words that the model knows about. So you might be limited to like 100,000 words and you can only generate from those words in the, in the set. Um, and you could imagine going all the way down to like a byte level where, or a character level where you're only predicting letter by letter what the next letter is coming or byte by byte what the next byte is coming. And there's a trade-off between how many different things you're predicting. Like if you're doing it at the byte level, that's only 256 values that you have to predict. If you're doing it at the word level, you might have to predict between hundreds and thousands of different words. And so they found this middle ground called byte pair encoding, um, which is basically looking at the the sequences of bytes in common Unicode. And they created a vocabulary of about 50,000 of the most common byte sequences. So you could imagine like um, just uni right here might be a byte sequence because it's a common prefix to a lot of different words. And it also has meaning on its own of like single. Um, so that's kind of the technique they use to find a common middle ground between not representing every word of all time and not just doing it all the way down to the byte level because then you lose out on some of the structure of words in general. Question on like that level of representation. I was just thinking about, and maybe this is moving too forward into like more modern GPT stuff, um, but I was just thinking about like, you know, the ways that you can ask ChatGPT for or whatever to you know produce a new name for your band or or you know just like make jokes that would have like weird kind of you know collided together words that are not necessarily in the input data with this like with these byte pairs is it is it still kind of limited to those 50,000 and then like in later gpts they make an advancement to make it more flexible like is it more limited at this point or is, does this kind of stay the same this stays about the same and if you think about it like all 256 of these bytes are in that set yeah so you can generate uh, everything it's just like we're gonna group together some common ones that it. we know work really well together mm -hmm. um so yeah that's kind of how they get the best of both worlds sweet yeah good question um so the model itself uh is a transformer with a few modifications from the original gpt model they actually this is the shortest section of the entire paper is them describing the model so it's really about the data um they increased the context window and they added a few more layers but other than that they're really talking about like this unsupervised approach and they also trained multiple versions of this model. So they did one with uh, 100 million parameters, 300 million, 700 million, and then the 1.5 billion parameter model that is GPT-2. And within all of their numbers that they report, they report the numbers for the small model, the medium models, and the large model. Um, 
these are the seven data sets or eight data sets that they said seven out of the eight they got state-of-the-art performance in a zero shot setting uh you'll notice that some of these say ppl and some of them say accuracy acc accuracy and some of them say bpp and some of them, these are all different metrics that they're evaluating against and so some of them lower is better and some of them higher is better i actually found this kind of hard to read until they dived in, dove into what the different data sets were so that's what they do and honestly what they spend a lot of the paper on is just like what are these data sets and how did we evaluate them so the first one was children books test that's what c b t stands for um and the idea is there's a bunch of children's books and they created a data set where they blocked out words of different types so they blocked out a lot of nouns and they blocked out a lot of verbs and they blocked out a lot of named entities like a location a, a full location like washington dc or something and the task is given the word that they blocked out somebody manually curated 10 possible answers that could be filled into that slot. So it might like a sentence might be the cat sat on the, and then this data set has 10 answers and they ask the model out of those 10, which one has the highest probability. Um, and you can see on the X axis here, it's like number of parameters in the model and on the Y axis it's accuracy. And as the model gets bigger, it gets better. And it actually performs almost at human level on this data set um, when it had never seen this data set before. It's literally just like predicting the probability of the word in the slot, uh, which is pretty wild. They did do a overlap test to see how much of these children's books were in the web crawl that they did. And they said that they only found one book that overlapped and it was the jungle book, which I thought was funny and interesting. The next data set they evaluated on was called LAM, LAMADA. All these data sets are just like crazy names that I don't know, academics come up with. Um, but this is one that's supposed to help you model long range dependencies in text. So the idea here is you'll have sentences that are 50 tokens or more of context and require you to know something from the beginning of the sentence to complete the last word in the sentence uh, and this is something that a lot of language models before transformers really struggled with because as they would go over the sentence they would kind of forget what was at the beginning but with transformers you can use the self-attention mechanism to look back at the start of the sentence to predict what's at the end. Um, so this is where they talk about perplexity, which I mentioned at the start is just like multiplying all the probabilities together for the full sentence. And they said they got a massive bump from 99.8 to 8.6, lower is better. Um, and a bump in accuracy from 19% to 52 percent um with this just unsupervised approach which is pretty wild um but this is the same kind of thing that they were doing in the children's book test but they were saying given this first 50 words what do you think the 51st word would be and it guessed the 51st word 52 percent of the time correctly which if you think about what we just did, uh, we couldn't even agree on <laughs> this one, right? So that's pretty wild. Granted, this data set was put together so that it should be relatively obvious what the last word should be. Like the example I just gave was way more preform, but think about that 52% on predicting that is pretty impressive. 
The next one was the Wenogrand schema, schema challenge. That is somebody's last name. Uh, he was the researcher that put together this data set. I dove in a little more to what it was at all. There's a academic paper that describes it, but the idea is there's a list of reading comprehension tasks where they have a sentence and then um, the idea is, I wrote this down, there's going to be amb ambiguous things in the text and the model has to figure out what the correct answer is when it might be ambiguous. So this example is the trophy doesn't fit in the brown suitcase because it's too big. What is too big? Is it the trophy or the suitcase? So it's kind of like a common sense reasoning that the trophy would be too big and not the brown suitcase in that example, because it could, in theory, refer to either one of them. Um, and so this data set was actually quite small. This is the one I was talking about that only had 273 examples. And Craig, I was looking Jessica at- also had a question in the chat. Me, I'm beside you. Ah, yes. This might be a silly question, but would somebody mind giving me the definition of token? Yes, that's a great question. We love silly questions and they're not silly. So the idea of a token is you can kind of think of it as just a word. Um, but when we were talking about this byte pair encoding, a token might be like just the prefix uni or the postfix code, or it might be unicode. It really depends on how you're splitting up the text. Um, and it depends on the vocabulary that you're using. But in general, I just kind of think of token and word as interchangeable. So when they say like at least 50 tokens, it's you can just kind of think of it as at least 50 words of context. Okay, perfect. So at least 50 words or parts of words. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. Cool. So the Winogrand um, schema challenge has been considered defeated now by these transformer models. It pretty much just nails these ones. Um, and there was a $25,000 prize for whoever could defeat this with a model first, according to the Wikipedia page, which I thought was fun. But now that context contest is over. Machines have won. The next one they did was reading comprehension. Uh, so this is a conversational question answering data set with uh, documents from seven different domains and a dialogue between a question asker and a question answerer about that document. So the idea is they took a conversation and tried to predict the final token or word of that conversation um, given the document as context. So it might be like a Wikipedia page and the question might be, where was the person born? And then they're trying to predict uh, in this case, they're just predicting the final token. So if it was like a multiple word answer, it's not truly fair, right? Because they might have already seen like Washington and would just have to predict DC or something like that new. And they might have to just predict York or Jersey. Um, but they said just on that task, it got 55%. F1, which is kind of like accuracy you can think of. Um, and it beat some of the baseline systems that were manually trained on 127,000 collected question answer pairs just for this question answering task. To put that in perspective, like when we were working on IBM Watson back in the day, it took a pretty decent amount of engineering and labor to get to 40% accuracy, and they just get 55% out of the box with this language modeling technique. Um, and they know when they were doing some error analysis on it out of that 45% that it got wrong. Some of the most common things were it would just hone in on like, is this a who, what, where, when, or why question? And if it was a who question, it would just pick a random name from <laughs> the document and 
a lot of the time that's just correct. So they weren't quite sure if it really learned the task or it just really learned at being really good at picking a who versus a when. And if you have the document as context, there's actually not that many who's you can pick from. So that was just a side note that they mentioned. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, depending on like the way in which they're normalizing the input text, like if those kind of capitalizations were still making it through, it would be like really not hard to figure out, you know, which which ones are the names and the who who questions. Yeah, totally. And if you think about it even further, it's probably the first name that was mentioned in yeah. the document that they're talking about. So. <laughs> Um, it's funny because those were all features that we would put into the model for IBM Watson is like, okay, what type of thing are they asking for? Okay, here's a document, rank higher the first mention of the person in, <laughs> in the document. And that's like what IBM Watson did under the hood. It's just feature engineering about this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's cool because this is like unsupervised learning the same kinds of things that we would have to feature engineer before. So summarization, uh, they used this daily mail data set and CNN data set. And so they would have the article and then they would have a too long dub read kind of thing after it uh, as the training data, if you were doing this in a supervised manner. And so what they did in the unsupervised manner is they just took the article and then they simply added the text TLDR at the bottom. They had the model generate a hundred tokens and they sampled the top couple, um, meaning they, in this case, it was just two. So they were like randomly picking between the top probability word or in the second highest probability word. And then they used the first three generated sentences as the summary. Um, and so there's no way to quantitatively evaluate this unless you had a human read it and give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But they said qualitatively, the summaries do look like summaries, um, but often they get counts, dates, or specifics wrong about the article because it's really just like, trying to make sentences that look real and there's no objective to really reference back in the article and pull out an actual fact. So that's something obviously they worked a lot on for the GPT-4 models, but at this GPT-2 stage, they were like, wow, it can even just do that if I put TLDR at the end of it. That's super interesting. Um, and I guess they did mention there's this metric called rogue, which I've never looked into, but I think that's just a metric on like how, uh, what's the overlap between the summarized sentence and the big document itself. I actually didn't look at into what rogue actually means, but there is a way to quantify that. The last one is translation. Um, and so they did English to French and French to English. And um, they conditioned the model, which they, they aren't even talking about prompting yet. That wasn't even really a word yet. So they were saying they're conditioning the model. And so basically they gave it a bunch of English text on one side, they put an equal sign and then they put French text on the other side and then prompted it with some English text and had it try to complete French text. This is another um, another task that has a very complicated scoring system. It's called blue or I don't know how they're supposed to actually pronounce that, but they said they got a score of five blue on English to French a score of 11.5 blue on French to English. Um, but the super interesting part about this was during the data pre-processing, they actually ran a filter and it was supposed to be only English text in this data set. So the web text data set itself already had a filter on it. So there wasn't supposed to be any French in there, or at least not French 
domains. Um, so they were shocked that it could do any translation at all. So they went back and they reran a language detector on the 400 gigabytes of data and found that there was 10 percent or 10 megabytes of data in the French language. That's all. And it was still able to get some of the translation correct, which is pretty wild. Um, they didn't dive into any more. They just said, this is interesting. <laughs> Let's keep an eye on this. Um, so yeah, the main idea is they had a bunch of these different tasks. Uh, normally, you would have to train a model to do each individual one. And the fact that they could simply do the predicting the next word and get results like this back in 2019 is really what started to kick off this, OK, let's grab a data set that's even larger than 40 gigabytes. Let's do one that's 800 gigabytes. Let's train a model that's not only uh, 1.5 billion parameters, but let's bump that up to 175 billion parameters. And that's what really kicked off this whole large language model hype and things. And it's it's kind of cool to see they didn't have words for a lot of these things, but they're starting to do prompting and they're starting to condition the model on these things. And yeah, I think it's a really interesting point in history there. Very cool. Good rundown. Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Any high level questions or thoughts, comments? Any like any what do you think is like the most meaningful uh, change since when you were first starting this when you're back in alchemy uh, along this lines? Yeah, I mean, the size of these models is a lot larger, which they were able to do that because of the new GPUs that were coming out. Like we were training some of our language models on a CPU on just Wikipedia. Um, and so we got reasonable results. But like they said in here, if you're just doing it on Wikipedia, then it only knows how to complete Wikipedia style text, which you would think is pretty diverse because they have a lot of diverse topics in there, but it's really not. It's like there's no conversations in Wikipedia of like a Reddit thread of people arguing with each other. <laughs> and there's no um, there's no data that's like a novel where it's telling a story within Wikipedia. So I feel like we were just limited on the, the size of the data, the size of the model. Um, and we were trying, we were like starting to do some of these things, but the fact that they just scaled this to the next level uh, was partly compute, partly model architecture, and partly just let's try this crazy thing. So hats off to them for taking it to the next level and then training GPT 3, which cost them millions of dollars to do that we would have never been able to do as a startup back then. Very interesting. Cool. Was that helpful, Jessica? Any... I was about to say, thanks, Greg. That was really great. And I feel like you run down through it really well. It was uh, it was really interesting. And what stands out to me is just like the rate, like the pace of development is, is so impressive. And also yeah. that part at the very end about <laughs> how on the 10 megabytes they were just able to like partially do some French translation um, is really interesting. Thoroughly enjoyed. It's wild to think about that. Because like you don't think about how common languages are, and then they have this result. And you're like, well, is French really that different than English? Like you start doing noun verb pairs, and you start like chaining together subsets of words. And the fact that it could do it at all. Yeah, oh, it's super so fascinating. Impressive. I happen to speak four languages and something that was always like mentioned to me growing up was that people find it surprising, but often the people who are best at math are also really strong in languages, like learning mm -hmm. multiple languages and vice versa. So it's just an interesting correlation. Definitely. And yeah, always blows my mind <laughs> that these machines can start to do it. Adam, what about you? Any 
Any thoughts? Uh, just kind of uh, taking it all in. It's you know, just fascinating stuff. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I think for the next week, let's just keep working through this anti LLM hype stuff. Uh, see what see what they did to go from GPT two to GPT three, and and even Chat GPT. I think that's the next one. Is like it's called training language models to follow instructions. Mm -hmm. So they kind of take it to the next step of okay, we're not just predicting the next word, but like let's do that as a first step, and then the second step of training let's be a little more specific about what we want the model to do. And that was kind of the jump between this raw predict the next word and the interface that we all know and love with chat GPT now, where you could say, write me some Python code or whatever. And then it kind of like shifts its attention and can start doing that. So excited to dive into that next week. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Jessica. Great to see you guys, Ben and Adam. Catch you on the flip side.